Hello again and welcome back. Chapter 23, Political Paralysis in the Gilded Age, 1869-1896. Let's get started. All right, a few key points here. First of all, the USA continues down this path of industrialization. Even the South, or this new South, begins to emerge, and we'll talk about that down the road a little bit here. Uh, in 1877, however, federal troops are removed from the South, and so Southern states are left to enforce Reconstruction on their own. And obviously, the Redeemers in the South permit this Jim Crow society to emerge, which is full of obstacles and barriers to African Americans. Uh, politics in general are corrupt. In this chapter, we see a lot with the Grant administration, uh, with the whiskey ring, right, and credit mobilier, and this sort of idea that the president doesn't even know that these things are happening. Uh, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Harrison, and Cleveland collectively are known as the forgettable presidents. Um, and in general, towards the end of the chapter, we start to see some changes in political alliance, and allegiance, I should say, uh, based on financial stability, debt, recession, and the government response to that. So let's look at how the two parties stood. The Republicans will wave the bloody shirt and um, enthusiastically nominate Grant. Uh, there is this belief that good generals make good presidents. We have had several of those prior to Grant, Washington, Jackson, William Henry Harrison, Zachary Taylor, uh, Franklin Pierce, and even Andrew Johnson, who was appointed military governor of Tennessee uh, with the title of Brigadier General. So you know, that kind of continues. The Democrats have one thing in common. They all opposed military reconstruction. But within the party, there was a split. Uh, some of these Democrats are debtors, and this includes Midwestern farmers, and some are creditors, and that includes the Eastern wealthy. And so their views on currency and the money supply uh, are going to be significant in this chapter. So Grant wins in 1868. Uh, he did support military reconstruction, but when he accepted nomination for the presidency, he did say, let us have peace. And he runs against Horatio Seymour, again, the former governor of New York, so you can see which way he would lean. He, in fact, announced the Ohio plan, which would have permitted uh, loans to be paid back in greenbacks, and that would have appeased those Midwestern debtors. Uh, greenback dollars, don't forget, were issued during the war due to a lack of available specie. Uh, they're not backed by gold, so when the war ends, they depreciate, uh, and therefore those who loan the money would be, be paid back, excuse me, in dollars that are worth less than they let out to begin with. And so when he repudiates the Ohio plan, he um, has kind of alienated some of those Democrats in the Midwest. Now, Grant wins, as you can see here. Uh, the electoral vote is 214 to 80, uh, but the popular vote is much closer. In fact, it's separated by about 300,000 votes. Uh, and you have to remember that in the days following the Civil War, the freedmen, and there's roughly 500,000 of them that voted in this election, uh, will have a significant impact on the outcome. Corruption was pretty much commonplace in this time, and so um, two men, Jim Fisk and Jay Gold, uh, do try to profit greatly by uh, bidding the price of gold up, uh, hoping that the federal government would not sell their reserves. Uh, unfortunately, uh, on Black Friday, September 24th, 1869, the Treasury was forced to sell gold from the reserves. That reduced the price, and that affected a lot of business people, not just Jim Fisk and Jay Gold. Um, there was a congressional probe to see if Grant had done anything wrong, and it was Maybe he was given the benefit of the doubt. They said that he did nothing crooked, uh, but we'll see more scandal with his administration uh, in the next few slides here. Also, uh, in the local arena, the boss Tweed and his Tweed ring uh, was very um, active in New York City affairs. This political machine stole $200 million from New York City taxpayers. Uh, he does die in prison, uh, largely due to the efforts of cartoonists like uh, Thomas Nass. He was very well known for portraying uh, the, the truth of who uh, William Boss Tweed actually was. Another iconic cartoon right here. Keeping in line with scandal, there's the Credit Mobilier scandal in 1872. Uh, the Union Pacific Railroad insiders here formed their own construction company, and then they hired themselves at very inflated prices, and as a result of that, they profited greatly. Uh, in order to make this happen, they actually paid off some key congressmen, most Republicans, uh, and also uh, Grant's vice president and Skylar Colfax. Um, kind of like this cartoon here. A little blurry, but I think you get the point. Another example of corruption within Grant's administration is the whiskey ring. And again, you know, Grant is not necessarily found personally guilty of this, uh, but it's people who are very close to him 
uh, that are involved. And so, you know, if he does know, I guess he's covering it up. But if he doesn't know, well, he probably ought to know he is the president. So in this case, millions of dollars in revenue from excise taxes that were um, acquired through uh, whiskey were actually stolen. Here's one of my favorite political cartoons of all time. You can see Grant holding several of his close cabinet members uh, by this, I guess, leather strap that says corruption on it while swinging from the third term bar. And so even before this corruption is exposed, there is a liberal Republican Party uh, emerging. In fact, they met in Cincinnati. They nominated Horace Greeley for president. And the Democrats also endorsed Greeley, so he's running for sort of two tickets here. Uh, the regular Republicans will renominate Grant, and he will win the election of 1872. But this divide in the Republican Party is significant because the liberal Republicans, well, they, they're, caused, they're going to cause a Republican Congress to pass the General Amnesty Act in 1872, removing political restrictions from most of the former Confederate leaders. Congress also reduced the high civil war tariffs and gave mild civil service reform under the Grant administration. You can see here, uh, Horace Greeley had actually died before the electoral ballot was cast. And so uh, these other candidates that you see here received uh, his votes as a result of that. So as usual, over-speculation led to a financial panic in 1873, and this was over speculation both building and in financing too many loans um, and profits just didn't show up um, there was a lot of default over 15,000 businesses were bankrupt as you can see uh, many people especially farmers in the west were unable to pay back money they had borrowed and so they began to push for inflation both the greenback and the unlimited coinage of silver um, to help them to do that now the resumption act of 1875 was supported by advocates of the hard money mentality and this required the government to continue to withdraw greenbacks from circulation and redeem all paper currency in gold at face value beginning in 1879. So this policy of contraction will take the money out of circulation and therefore raise the value of the greenbacks. That's not going to help those folks who are in debt and can't get a hold of greenbacks as it is. This Republican hard money policy actually has a negative uh, political impact, uh, especially as I said, the farmers of the Midwest, and we'll see a new party emerging as a result of that. Um, it also helped to elect Democratic House of Representatives in 1874. So throughout the Gilded Age, uh, both parties really did see eye to eye on most of the major issues, uh, in particular economic issues, uh, even currency. Uh, but there was fierce um, competition amongst the parties, uh, and the party loyalty uh, was very strong. And so we should talk about why that is. The pageant suggests that the biggest difference between the two parties was along ethnic and cultural lines, uh, particularly religion. Uh, and it says that the Republican Party had a strong um, connection to sort of the puritanical faith. Um, and therefore believe that the government should have a role in shaping the morality of society. They had a lot of support in the Midwest and small northern towns, uh, whereas the Democratic Party um, had a stronger base in the South and northern industrial cities. Keep in mind also the Republicans had the Grand Army of the Republic. This was a fraternal organization formed after the conclusion of the Civil War, uh, where Civil War veterans really kind of voted as a block, as did the Freedmen, which we already talked about. Both parties, however, were supported by patronage, uh, and uh, this idea of giving out uh, government jobs to loyal voters does help solidify control. And here is Mark Twain, and I know that my students did read Huck Finn this year, so you are familiar with um, his style and a bit about him. But in case you didn't know, he did label this period the Gilded Age, kind of mocking it, saying that it appeared to be very shiny on the outside, but in fact it was something else below the surface. And so there are two schools of thought that are emerging within the Republican Party, uh, those that embrace the spoils system and patronage, and those that uh, perhaps did not. And so now in 1876, Grant was considering a third term. Um, however, the House passed a bipartisan resolution uh, reminding him that a third term was somewhat of a dictator's move. So uh, instead, the Republicans will uh, run Rutherford B. Hayes. And the Democrats will run Samuel J. Tilden, who was known for prosecuting the boss tweet. Now, Tilden will win the popular vote, but he's one vote shy of winning the Electoral College. And at this time, there were still 20 electoral votes that were being disputed. And those were in Louisiana, South Carolina, and Florida, three states that still had uh, federal troops there as part of this military reconstruction.
And so a constitutional dilemma does emerge because it's not really clear specifically who was supposed to count these votes. Ultimately, a commission of 15 men is created, and they give the election to Hayes. And the Democrats will agree to this as long as Hayes agrees to withdraw federal troops from Louisiana and South Carolina, the last two places that were occupied by federal troops during military reconstruction. And you could say the Republicans are abandoning their commitment to racial equality because they're not there to enforce it. Um, however, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 was passed, and it guaranteed equal accommodations in public places and prohibited racial discrimination in jury selections. However, and unfortunately, the Supreme Court will rule against this and say that much of it's actually unconstitutional because the 14th Amendment only prohibits government but not individuals from violating civil rights of others. This chart here can be seen in our textbook, and it shows you that 15-man commission and their straight party vote. And so once federal troops are removed from the South, the Deemers take over, and this sort of Jim Crow society emerges. Uh, and Jim Crow laws are just sort of a blanket term used for uh, laws and ordinances that restricted African Americans in any way, shape, or form. We're going to talk about that in a few seconds here. Uh, but blacks also didn't have a lot of financial resources to fall back on. They couldn't necessarily buy land. Uh, and so they're going to be looking for other means to acquire it and therefore farm for themselves. And you know, sharecropping and tenant farming emerges, uh, both of which are sort of a crop lien system that uh, unfortunately led to perpetual debt for those who are renting the land. And we did talk about this before before vacation, excuse me. And we are going to see this famed sharecropper's contract that we keep talking about. Uh, but Jim Crow laws, you know, often did attack voting rights. And so literacy tests were used, poll taxes were used, and of course the famed grandfather clause in which a person couldn't vote unless their grandfather voted in the 1860 election, effectively banning all of the freedmen from voting in the South. The Supreme Court also upholds sort of segregation in general but, uh, you know, oppression of African Americans in their decision in Plessy v. Ferguson, which said that separate but equal facilities were illegal under the 14th Amendment. Now, we'll come back to this idea in the future, and we'll see sort of uh, a theoretical view in the 1950s, uh, an idealistic view, I should say, that separate facilities are inherently unequal, but in a, in a more literal sense, in you know, in the days of Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, those facilities were by no means equal. And so there's uh, problems with that as well. So following the panic of 1873, railroad workers went on strike after their wages were cut nationally by 10%. Unfortunately for them, President Hayes supported owners and not workers, and he actually called in federal troops in response to these strikes. There was also a lot of conflict between the Irish and the Chinese. Both groups were very involved in the building of the railroads, the Chinese in the West Coast, and the, uh, the Irish in the East, and sort of the central part of the country. And as a result of that, and probably other factors as well, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, which restricted Chinese immigration severely to the United States. So for the first time, a specific group is being targeted with immigration policy. And here's a cartoon uh, <clears throat> from Harper's Weekly. You can see where Columbia is protecting a Chinese man from an angry Irish mob. So the Republican, James Garfield, will win the election of 1880. He's a half-breed, so he was in favor of civil service reform. And on his ticket was Vice President Chester A. Arthur, who is a stalwart. Uh, now, they ran against Winfield Scott, the Democrat. It's a close election, but Garfield wins. Unfortunately for him, he's assassinated soon after by a man named Charles Coteau, who also was looking for a civil service job, and he thought that if Arthur were in office, that, uh, well, Coteau and his Conklinite friends would all have federal jobs. Um, that didn't happen, though, because Arthur continued the half-breed approach. And the biggest thing that has passed that you must know is this Pendleton Act of 1883. And as you can see, it made mandatory campaign contributions for federal employees illegal. Uh, and it established that the Civil Service Commission to make appointments to federal jobs on the basis of merit. It has a test to show you were competent. But as you can see in point three here, uh, politicians begin to look elsewhere for campaign contributions. Uh, and so they form these marriages of convenience with big business. Here's Garfield on the left, and Chester A. Arthur on the right. Insert sideburn joke. Now, half-breed James G. Blaine does receive the Republican nomination in 1884, and he'll run against old Grover, Grover Cleveland, a Democrat. Uh, this is a pretty bad campaign. As you can see, a lot of mudslinging uh, involved in it. Uh, and it goes back and forth. Grover Cleveland was criticized for having an illegitimate 
the child. Uh, but Blaine, um, perhaps in not saying something and not repudiating this Republican claim that the Democrats were the party of rum, Romanism, and rebellion, uh, insulted a lot of people, including a lot of Irish voters in New York. It's probably cost him New York and the election. The Cleveland wins by a pretty slim. So Old Grover will be the first Democrat in 28 years since James began, and I believe. He did favor patronage. He did replace thousands of federal employees with Democrats. And he was a strong supporter of laissez-faire economics, sort of this hands-off approach, um, uh, minimal government regulation intervention. And he said, though the people support the government, the government should not support the people. He is known for being honest. Uh, it's probably his best quality. And, of course, that mustache. So in the 1880s, the federal government had a surplus of about $145 million due to the high wartime tariff. And Cleveland, being a Democrat, wants to see the tariff go down. So he calls on Congress in 1887 uh, to do that. Now, Republicans oppose the reduction of tariffs because they feel that it will hurt business. Uh, and so they will nominate Benjamin Harrison, and they'll use this tariff as the issue in the 1888 election. And although Cleveland won the popular vote, Harrison will still win the election. So while the Republicans now have the presidency, they don't have a real majority uh, within the House of Representatives. In fact, uh, the Democratic presence is so high that they're threatening to obstruct all business in the House. Now, there's a new Speaker of the House, Thomas B. Reed of Maine, who used intimidation and his debate skills to get Congress in line, so to say. He actually manipulated roll calls uh, and made sure that business would continue. And he is going to be the head of this billion-dollar Congress, which is named because they are the first Congress to appropriate that amount of money. They spent a lot of money, gave pensions to Civil War veterans, and began to increase government purchases on silver. And in order to keep that revenue flying, the McKinley Tariff Act of 1890 was passed, which basically forced uh, farmers to buy expensive American goods, uh, but kind of also force them or uh, require them, I guess you could say, to sell their goods on the unprotected market. You know, 48.4% on dutiable goods is a, is a very high burden for people who are already in debt. This cost Republicans the rural vote and the majority in the Congress in 1890. I once had a political science professor say that Americans make their political decisions based on the amount of money in their pocket more than anything else. And while I don't know that that's necessarily true, I do know that the Populist Party or the People's Party uh, was formed out of this real financial dire uh, situation that farmers in the West were, were and the South were dealing with. Uh, and they propose a lot of things that are specific to their interest, including a graduated income tax to perhaps alleviate the uh, high tariff rates. Uh, they also suggest government ownership of railroads, telegraphs and telephone, the direct election of U.S. senators, a one-term limit on the presidency, the adoption of the initiative and the referendum to give citizens more control in passing laws, a shorter workday and immigration restrictions. And while uh, not all of those are going to be enacted, many of them are. And so, again, with the third party concept, you know, the, it's very difficult for a third party to win an election. But what they do very often is bring issues to the table that are then absorbed by the two mainstream parties. OK, so the populists will nominate General James B. Weaver for the presidential election of 1892. The book calls him the old greenbacker. So I think you know where he stands on uh, inflation and greenbacks in general. And you might think, fortunately, in 1892, there was a series of violent strikes that occurred that could have potentially linked urban workers with this primarily agrarian movement. Um, unfortunately for the populists, it seems that, you know, these poor industrial workers still sided with the interest of big business. Um, as opposed to this, you know, really you know, agrarian movement, as I've already said. Um, and the populists lose. And another reason why the populists lose the election is because they start to have this kind of um, lean towards equality. Uh, populist leaders like Thomas Edward Watson felt that black men had the right to vote. And Southern whites uh, voted against this because um, they just had that kind of cultural barrier uh, that prevented a link between the South and the Midwest that would have propelled this agrarian party, or could have at least, to the presidency. As you can see here on the map, the you know the real support for the populist parties in the West, Midwest, um, and, and that's where it lies. Okay, so Grover Cleveland wins the election of 1892. He's the only president to win after being previously defeated. Uh, 
Here's that map again. You can see that Democratic support has grown. You could also note, and I didn't mention this on the last slide, that the populists as a third party still win 22 electoral votes. So that's very significant. But within the Panic of 1893, the worst economic depression of the 1800s, there are debtors up in arms, there are workers that are restless, and there's 8,000 American businesses that have collapsed in a period of roughly six months. So Cleveland has the luxury of dealing with this. Okay, so the Sherman Silver Purchase Act of 1890 uh, basically said the government had to purchase a certain amount of silver every month, and when they did, they had to issue treasury notes that were backed by silver, so people who acquired these would turn them in for gold, which by law, uh, the government had to pay them in that gold, and that further drained the treasury. Now, I guess the level of $100 million was considered to be safe for supporting roughly $350 million in currency, um, and as you can guess, the levels were dipping far below that. In 1894, the Treasury had about $41 million in gold. So as a result of this, Cleveland was forced to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1893 uh, and instead borrowed money from the banker's banker, J.P. Morgan, roughly $65 million in gold to increase and supplement the Federal Treasury's reserve. Into the scene comes this man, William Jennings Bryan, who we will later know for his Cross of Gold speech, uh, but he is known to be a powerful and captivating speaker uh, and really sort of champions this idea of free coinage of silver. So you got to understand that J.P. Morgan represented industry and power and banking, and so folks in the West and silverites and debtors, they really had a pretty negative view of this loan from Morgan to the federal government. In addition to that, a new tariff is passed, the Wilson-Gorman Tariff, 1894, and it only slowly, slightly lowered the rates uh, and added a 2% tax on incomes over $4,000. And so this was not very appealing to people either. Now, the Supreme Court did rule income taxes unconstitutional in 1895, and it's not until the 20th century that we'll see an income tax for the 16th amendment. Uh, but these embarrassments caused Democrats to lose seats in Congress, giving the Republicans a majority in Congress. Well, I thank you again for watching this. Uh, that's it for tonight. Again, if you have any questions, please see me in class tomorrow or feel free to email. Take care.